that that was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. That that Bill and Patty, thank you so much. That was like dual pianos. That was awesome, fantastic. And Miss Patty now is going to have her children's story. Or not children's story. Forgive me, it's a story. <laughs> from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. I just found the story, and I thought it was great. So, have you been to camp, Gilbert? Have you ever been to camp? No? Any camp. When I was little, I'd go to junior camp, too. But um, And then, this is so appropriate because I'm going to camp next weekend, and I'm so excited. <clears throat> All right, so, um, this story was written by Dick Dirksen, and he's a great storyteller. And so I'm going to kind of read it the way that he wrote it, okay? Uh, so they were at camp, and he said, You know it's dry when dust puffs up above your shoes when you walk. And by July, dust puffed halfway up our legs. No rain, no thunderstorms, no water in the springs, no water running into the storage tanks. Barely enough water to flush all the camp toilets three times. And 209 year olds were coming to camp that Sunday, just seven days away. So everybody at the camp prayed. They prayed and prayed and they begged God for rain. And they reminded God that Pine Springs was his summer camp and that the ministry we were doing here for the kids was his ministry. And we prayed for a thunderstorm that would fill the lake without starting fires in the forest. We prayed for water from the sky on any cloud he would choose. We prayed certain that God was hearing and that his response would be rapid and powerful, a direct answer to our prayers. But nothing happened. And Monday, um, there came a new person to camp. Her name was Cindy and she was going to help with the horses. And she listened to our water prayers, and she was amazed at our conviction and wondered about the God who wasn't answering. Tuesday, we called a special camp council. We have a bigger problem than dry ground, our director said. The Forest Service tells us that if we don't have water, lots more water, 
we're going to have to cancel camp. So then they prayed even harder, and they and they watched the clouds. And, and actually on Thursday, they saw some clouds. They floated as white puffy wisps that floated over the mountain peaks then disappeared into the shimmering heat of summer day. No water, none. By Friday, we were thoroughly discouraged. Pine Springs Camp is one of the star summer camps in the North American Seventh-day Adventist Church. And each summer, thousands of kids go to the camp. And they sing songs, they laugh, they ride horses, all sorts of things. This is obviously God's camp, and he will make sure all goes right. Right? Wrong. It didn't happen. No water. So they prayed and prayed. And they started changing their prayers from, please, Lord, send us water, to, Lord, we need water. We need water. And we need it now. No water. So Friday evening, um, the director and, and Dick Dirksen walked up beyond the boys' camp to the giant water tanks nestled beneath the pines. These are big, those big, huge water tanks that you see on big um, things, they're like 10,000 gallons of water, and each tank was nearly dry. And the pipes that fed the clear, cold water from the spring, you know, if the water goes through the pipes, they were hot. There was no water in them. Hmm. And so unless a miracle occurred, we were going to have to close camp. So we told God, it's time for a miracle. And we described the thunderstorm, we described what we needed, we told him even which mountain it should come over. And, and Sabbath, one of the counselors asked to speak before we worshipped. And this counselor said, I'm bothered by how we have been commanding God to do something, our, to do something but we have not been doing anything ourselves. We've been praying for rain, but if we get a big, huge rainstorm, the water will just drain down into the valley. It won't flow into our lake or help our, our water supply. We've got to put our own energy into this, do our own part, and not just wait for God to send rain. So then he passed out shovels and hoes and rakes and showed us where to dig the trenches and where to clear the pine needles and where to put the mounds of dirt to dam up coming rain. Church was canceled and they were all out digging, getting ready for the rain. So, and as they worked hard, a big thunderstorm came and they were so excited and they shouted praises to God. But you know what? The thunderstorm rained just a few drops and then it was gone. No water. And after sundown, they met in the cafeteria a sad group of counselors, archers, and cooks and leaders. Hope had washed from our hearts. We prayed poorly. We sang worse. Then Cindy, the lady who came to help with the horses, she stood and she walked slowly to the center of our pity-filled circle and she spoke. You guys make me sick. All week long, you've been telling me about this wonderful God you serve, about how you can trust him with your lives and everything, about how he's going to send rain because he thinks this is the best summer camp on the planet. Now, when he pushes your faith to the limit by leaving you dry, you put on long faces and cry as if he's forgotten you, left you alone out here on the mountain, abandoned you in the dust. We all stared silently listening, and nobody really knew what to say. And uh, if you really believe in your God, then quit whining about his choices. Get down on your knees and celebrate everything he's doing for you. And by the way, you've been asking just for rain, demanding that he do things your way. What if he has a better idea? Which God often does have a better idea. Now, get out of here. Go somewhere and pray for forgiveness. And we went shredded in spirit, repentance on our lips. 
Later that night, several of us were talking humbly near the dry creek that threaded through the camp. Two of the counselors, Jack and Don, said goodnight and headed up to the boys' camp. Moments later, we heard a scream that sounded like Jack was being attacked by a cougar. I ran, others right behind me, Jack screams, drawing us into his danger. We found him standing beside a 10,000 gallon water tank. Cold water pouring out the overflow and showering over Jack. The tank, which had been 98% empty just a couple hours before, was now full of God's water. Isn't that amazing? I took a brief shower, then slipped around to the intake pipe, the one that carries water, into the tank, and it was still hot, dry and hot. Nothing was flowing into that tank. That night, and for the rest of the summer, we served in awe of the spring in the tank, water, pure cold water, more than we needed, and God sent it to them. Just like God sent it to Moses. But that's not the only thing that God does. He doesn't just answer water prayers. He answers our prayers. Maybe not the way that we think, because he didn't answer it the way they thought. But he answers our prayers the way he knows is best. Okay? So, all right, let's pray. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you so much for answering our prayers in the way that you know is best for each one of us. Help us to trust in you and help us to cheerfully give our problems to you and know that you're going to take care of us in one way or another and we need to have faith in you and give us the faith and the courage that we need. And uh, thank you so much for answering prayer and for thank you for Gilbert and be with him and his family. In Jesus' name, amen.